we're evaluating our options and you know, Minnesota is, according to the Tax Foundation and others, one of the biggest subsidizers of the federal government. So in the past, we have always accepted these types of infusions of money from the federal government on the theory that Minnesota is paying more than its share of the bill, that we're actually a net subsidizer of the federal government. So notwithstanding my concerns about federal spending and federal policy, that Minnesota deserves to have its share of a program like that because we're paying more than our share. And so I'm open to taking it, but we just haven't made a final decision on it yet. When are you going to decide? You know, we don't have to decide until September 24th, but so it's sometime in the next few weeks. Well, Governor, I guess what are you trying to consider if you, on the one hand, you say you have concerns about the federal spending? Well, one thing we're considering, for example, is you know, we balanced our budget without it. And you know, Biennium is going to end with a positive cash balance. Um, and if you include the cash flow account, it's going to probably be at least a half a billion dollars. And may, if we take the FMAP money, it may be more, um, depending on what the economy does and the subsequent forecast. So at least at the moment, our projections are we're going to end the biennium with a positive balance. We don't actually need the money for this biennium um, to make the books balance, but that's a different issue than you know, whether it's wise for Minnesota to take it for Minnesota's sake. And what would happen to the money if we didn't use it? Would it just be respent in other states, or would the federal government be able to save it? Are there any strings attached to it if we do take it? You know, what kind of commitments does that uh, require the state to make? Would that tie the hands of the next governor in some way that might be uh, limit their choices when they have to put together their budget on relatively short notice? You know, keep in mind this money doesn't come in until early next year, you know, January or so. So the new governor it won't come in on my watch, it'll come in under the next governor's watch. And we want to make sure we don't do anything that would un unwisely tie the hands of the next governor uh, to make sure they have full full range of choices on budget matters. Do you have answers to some of these questions? What happens to it if you don't take the money? Those are the kinds of things we're looking into, Martiga. And again, I'm not signaling there's some big, you know, we've done this before many times, both in 2003. We did it, uh, was it last year, Brian, or the year before? Was it? Too, yeah. So I mean, we've crossed, we've dealt with these issues many times before. We're just checking to see if there's anything different about this batch that was in the last few batches. Governor, you've done a bunch of state budgets. Uh, Tom Emmer, the last couple of days, has been talking about that state employees, government employees, make 30 to 40 percent more than public employees, even when you take out the benefits. Has that been your experience? Well, the studies, I think, are very clear on this, including a recent USA Today story as well as other studies. It used to be that government employees were over-benefited and underpaid. People would say, yes, I'll serve in government employment because even though the salary isn't as good, the benefits are better. And now the studies are pretty consistently showing that relative to their private sector counterparts, public employees are often over-benefited and overpaid. And that's not a matter of political rhetoric. I mean, it's been documented. I would commend to you uh, as one example, the USA Today cover story from just a few weeks ago is a very dramatic example that underscores that point. On the budget more broadly, you know, I know everybody's talking about this so-called so large uh, budget deficit, but if you actually look at the math, there's no deficit at all if the state simply spends uh, what it's spending now and lives within the revenues that are coming in. And so uh, that's why we had this proposal last year to have as the budget balancing benchmark the amount of money that we're taking in in the current budget cycle, but instead what we have is a system that on autopilot projects a bunch of increased spending and then declares a deficit. So it is, in my view, largely an accounting fiction and it should be fixed. We have a really distorted definition of what's a balanced budget. Uh, so for example, the real math here is in the current biennium we're going to spend in state dollars, around $30 billion. We can get you the exact numbers. And uh, in the next biennium, the revenues from that benchmark are projected to increase 7%. And so if, you, if the state can live within, almost 8% actually, state can live within an 8% increase in revenues, which it easily be able to do, um, there would be no budget deficit if that were the benchmark. Even if you include the federal money, uh, the spending then for the state and the federal money that came in was about $32.8 billion. But this forecast that we're benchmarking against says, well, you're not going to spend $32.8, you're going to spend $38, which is ridiculous. I mean, it's a ridiculous assumption. It's a 
percent increase over the current biennium just because some uh, bureaucratic projection uh, deems that we're going to have automatic increases in spending. So that's the $5 billion deficit. If you simply continue the unallotments that we have had in effect for you know, a year and a half or nearly two years now, which they're going to do anyhow, it's obvious, that gets the deficit down to about $2 billion. And then the rest of that increase between what I just described up to $38 billion is mostly health and human services increases and LGA increases. And so you can eliminate most of that simply by dialing those back to something closer to what we're spending now. And so this isn't that hard even to solve. I mean, it's a relatively, in my view, relatively uh, easy challenge. Does that include uh, commitments we've already made, such as Job Z, or would that remove those out of the budget? That's all, I don't want to say inconsequential financially, but if you look at the amount of money involved there, it, it's not a game changer. The big money in terms of the difference between what the state is spending in this biennium and that $38 billion autopilot bureaucratic forecast that sets the benchmark for the uh, alleged deficit is uh, the increases are the assumption that the unallotments will expire and all that spending will snap back instantly, which it, they're not going to. Uh, you know, all the candidates are talking about continuing them to some degree. And the other big increase areas are in $1.6 billion or so in health and human service increases and LGA increases compared to current spending. And it's preposterous. I mean, the economy is flat. People's wages are flat. I mean, the notion that some mindless bureaucratic system just says we're going to have a, a $5 billion uptick in spending is preposterous. And that system needs to be changed, and that's why we got back to that budget balancing proposal that said the new definition, that we said that the budgeting process should be reformed, and that the new definition is going to be uh, you can't spend in the next biennium as a starting point more than, you spent, more than the revenues that you took in in the current biennium. Uh, that proposal didn't even get a hearing in the Democrat-controlled legislature, or much of a hearing, I should say. Yeah, sorry, Tim. Have you ever suggested um, campaign ideas or otherwise council representative member on campaign strategy or don't suggest you try this or don't do this? Well, we, we've had a number of conversations about, you know, things, uh, you know, certainly have shared a few ideas uh, here and there, but, uh, you know, he's got to run, his, he's running his campaign the way he would like to, but I, I've certainly talked to him on, on many occasions. Have you been talking to folks, and do you think it's possible with the record crops out there and record prices that the farm economy could help that deficit go down a little? Well, our farm economy, Mary, that's a, that's a good point, is, is one of the bright spots in the Minnesota economy. And as you know, uh, one in five jobs or so, directly or indirectly in Minnesota, is attributable to agriculture, food, food processing, related industries, and then the indirect you know, industries that flow from that. And that's a relative bright spot. Uh, it's not enough to change the whole economy of the state, but it certainly is a positive and stabilizing force uh, for Minnesota. You know, again, this morning got a news clip, I think, where was that one from unemployment rates, Bruce? Uh, MSNBC. MSNBC came out with the top 10 states for you know, low unemployment. Minnesota was in the top 10. We have the lowest unemployment rate uh, we've had relative to the federal unemployment rate in 40 years. It's still too high, but uh, we've got relative good news on that front. Oh, Martiga, what, I, what I'm saying is, you know, the legislature just refused to make the unallotments permanent, and, and, and I think they were kind of bet on the outcome of the elections and try to change it in some way. But, you know, they, those school payment deferrals have been used every time the school's been in crisis in the modern history of the state. They've never been paid back in one, uh, you know, they've never been reversed in one full leap. They've always been uh, shifted back incrementally. I will guarantee you as soon as we're, as sure as we're standing here, that's what will happen this time. They should have just done that last year when we offered that at this table in the back of the room, but they refused to make the unallotments permanent. So this uh, alleged deficit is not even that hard to solve for the reasons I outlined earlier. And part of it is simply uh, saying to the schools on that payment deferral, the current schedule or will hold as it is or it'll get shifted back incrementally. And keep in mind, it's, they get all their money. They just get one chunk of it six months later than they would have. Governor, we have time for just one more. 
Uh, you're going to China next week? What are you hoping? It's next week. Two weeks. Two weeks. Uh, it's what are you two hoping weeks. to um, get from that trip in terms of building the economy here? Well, one of the, there's, there's really two primary focuses for the trip. One is to encourage more Minnesota businesses to consider exports to China and to help them understand how to do that and to get a look at it, uh, including successful stories from others who've done it. And then the other is to try to encourage uh, the possibility of foreign investment, you know, in Minnesota. And we've had success at both. You know, for example, SR Steel would be a positive example of foreign investment in Minnesota that's helping to revitalize and you know, paint the future for the mining industry in northern Minnesota. Okay. Thanks, guys.